Hi there, me again, your humble, friendly neighborhood stroke assaulter. So, today's episode is going to be a bit of a continuation. Um, I sort of left it hanging on post-stroke role change. So I said I was going to do a couple of videos on post-stroke role change. Uh, on the social, uh, family, and employment side. Well, I'm going to hold off on the employment one. Because I'm not back at work yet, so I can't really speak to that. Uh, the only thing I can say about that, in brief, is I'm very anxious about going back to work, and I'll do a video just on that at some point. Um, family one, we'll do that one again at another time. So we're going to talk about social role changes. So one of the things that is going to distinctly change, ir irrevocably, the day you have your stroke is your social world. Right? It is how, well, one, you are able to interact with the world or not, um, how the world is able to interact with you, um, and then, I'm going to be honest, how willing are your immediate close friends, uh, friends and family, how willing are they going to accept that you're a bit of a shit show at times? Right? Well, I'll be honest about that. So let's just talk about your post-stroke um, change in social identity, right? So there's a couple couple things I'm going to get uh, outline right off the hop. It all depends on a couple of factors that are completely outside your control. One, how bad was your stroke? Like how devastating was that event? Two, how quickly did you or did you not get help? Like how fast was that medical intervention? Um, and then three, where did that leave you? So you've had your stroke, you're in the hospital. Where do you score on the scales that decide where you go next? Right? I'm going to say it, and I say it all the time, I was lucky. I was incredulously lucky. Um, you know, I... Can be drastically worse for me, and, and I that that is something I, I think of every day. My life could be irrevocably worse, different, altered. <laughs> I'm cognizant of that, and, and I, I don't try to take that for granted. Um, now then, I had my stroke at work in front of 100 to 150 people I happen to know, some of them very well. <laughs> I had my stroke in front of a very close friend. Um, I had another very close friend at work who came to the hospital, a friend of mine I shoot with. Um, I play airsoft. He's in the team I belong to. Uh, so he came to visit me in the hospital. Um, we, uh, the, the, the guys I shoot with, we have a very morbid sense of humor and if it wasn't the little bit of levity that Dave was there to provide, it, it would have been a lot worse. Um, so it all depends on your friends, right? And where your stroke has left you. I had a lot of people come visit me right after my stroke. Um, there was Dave, there was Katie, uh, there was Norma, there was Richard, um, his wife Erica, their little guy Connor. Um, Sebastian and then Dave came around the day I got out. They didn't know I was about to get discharged. That just happened to be that way. My parents were there. So I had a bunch of people from work or people I used to work with come to visit me. People were wanting to come visit me, but I just didn't know what I was up to um, or where I was going to be on any given moment. Um, oh, and uh, Patty. Patty came to visit me. He uh, he brought me a cheeseburger and a Happy Meal toy uh, that... that, that uh, Thursday night, Friday morning at like 2, 3 in the morning in ICU. Thank you for that, Patty. Um, yeah. So, I still have the toy, by the way. Um, oh, Dave, you also brought me a Happy Meal the day I got out, and I still also still have that toy. <laughs> and Dave, again, thank you for the lovely pajama pants. Um, anyways, so, where does your stroke leave you? Does it leave you, like, in a hospital for the next couple of months in a rehab, rehabilitation, recovery facility, <laughs> or does it take you like me? Cause there's a fair amount of stroke folk that go hospital home, right? 
I didn't need to go to a rehab or recovery facility. Um, I don't know how that would have played out if I had to. I really, really don't. Um, that would have been an interesting endeavor. So, and your friends and family, they're going to want to visit, right? Now then, depending on your physical limitations, how mobile are you? Can you feed yourself? Can you toilet yourself? Can you dress yourself? Um, your communication deficits or limitations. Um, right after my stroke, if you go to the week one, day one freedom video, right, that's as I'm being wheeled off the hospital. So that, that's me um, three days after my stroke. Not a pretty sight, I know. Um, so what it comes down to ultimately is how accepting are your friends and family? There are going to be people that you used to communicate with regularly that they're just going to fall away. They're, 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 their communication is going to die. Some of them are horrible humans. Some of them are full-on, fuck-off, horrible humans. Some of them, they just don't know how to deal with your shit. And that's not your fault. That is totally their fault. Like The fact that they're not able to be understanding and supportive, you know, um, and, and whatnot. So it's not your fault, right? Uh, so also depends for your post-stroke sense of so, uh, social identity. So what did you used to do, right? Now, I've been able to get out on the airsoft field two times since my stroke. Uh, one time was fairly shortly after my stroke. It's probably too soon for me to be on the field. Um, and then the last time, about a month and a half after my stroke, like two months, I think. Again, wasn't that effective. I still have deficits. Don't get me wrong. There are still days where I probably shouldn't be doing things I'm trying to do. But that being said, how active were you? What were you doing before your stroke? And there may be cases where your self, sense of self post-stroke is irrevocably changed from what your pre-stroke sense of self was. Um, and that all depends on what your activity level was, what your activities were, um, how often did you participate in those activities. You know, like if you're an avid reader and you belong to a book club, and you can't read anymore, and you don't like books on tape, because you'd prefer to read. Um, if you used to have dinner parties, and you love to cook, but now you can't, because this hand, or that hand, is basically a meat club, right? You can't really get any dexterity out of it. Um, were you a backpacker, a hiker, you know, and, and now walking is a difficulty, or canoeing, because of that lack of balance, now makes you violently throw up. You know, were you into, like myself, airsoft, some type of shooting sport where, you know, you need mental acuity and you need to be physically active at the same time. So, um, although my friends did say well, they could possibly start a GoFundMe for some kind of tracked Argo with an airsoft minigun and I'd basically become like the team support heavy gunner, right? Yeah, fun friends. But your sense of social identity depends on many things, right? Your social identity depends on how you know those friends, how long have you known those friends, um, what do you do with those friends, um, you know, how intense you go out to participate. Like if you, if you play like hockey twice a week in some kind of league with your friends and you're known to that guy that gets on the ice no matter what and all of a sudden you can't even fucking lace skates, right? Are you going to want to be that guy to say, hey, can you help me lace my skates? I, I, I don't want to be that guy. Like, there's no way I would turn to one of my mates and say, hey, listen, I can't lace my boots. Can you can you do it my boots so I can go shoot today? I wouldn't do that, right? Um, and, and part of your social identity is caught up in how much help you're willing to ask for. Now, that's not to say that I'm not going to ask for help. Let's just put that out there right now. It's not to say that I'm unwilling to ask for help. There's just certain levels of help that I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that. And, and that's more of an ego thing for me, not for them. 
Because knowing my friends, they tie my boots correctly and then tie the laces together, so I'm now a tripping hazard. Um, but, you know, that's my friends. Um, also, part of the social piece, um, I've had various, when I was initially post-stroke, when I was stuttering horribly, um, where a five-minute conversation could fake, take 15, just simply because of my stuttering, stammering, word finding and selection issues, right? It was me causing that problem. Um, I was in a restaurant the night I got out from the hospital and the waitress there, staff was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Like I, I can't even say how amazing they were. Um, I went into the local Tim Hortons, one of them here in Aurelia, <clears throat> and the lady behind the counter I've been in that restaurant almost every day for three years. You know, she's might know what I used to take for my coffee on a regular basis. Um, she basically accused me of lying. I tried to tell her, hey, listen, I've had a stroke. But again, picture stuttering, stammering, word finding selection issues, right? Um, it's kind of embarrassing to say, hey, listen, you know, this might not take a while. I've had a stroke. Um, uh, so I... I won't go into that Tim Hortons ever again. And in fact, I'm, you know, have a complaint at the corporate level against that store and that individual. Uh, another restaurant up the street from me, it was a patron. He got all stupid and got all huffy, right? So part of your need, want, desire, ability to be social is going to be predicated on the response you get from others. Um, Kensington Burger Bar here in Aurelia. The staff there have been brilliant, absolutely amazing uh, in their response. I, you know, used to go in there for a nice tea and a burger, maybe the odd beer and a burger, right, or whatever. And and the staff there have been absolutely just just amazing. I I, I can't commend them enough. So part of that social piece is stigma, right? I don't look like I had a stroke. I don't have a pronounced facial droop. I don't have like massive limb issues. I don't use a walker. I might need a cane from day to day. Still figuring that one out. There is a possibility I may need a cane. Um, uh, then you get into other issues, right? How well can you communicate? Do you need adaptive devices? Do you have a support animal? Um, do you have, you know, fill in the blank, right? There's many reasons why post-stroke your social identity may be drastically impacted. Um, part of that, you have no control over for a couple of reasons. One, it's your stroke and it left you in a state that it left you. I can't anticipate, predict where that's going to be. Your stroke left you where it left you, right? But that's all there is to it. Second piece is outside of your control the person that you're going to have to deal with, right? Um, I let, and I'm blunt. I'm just direct about it. If you want to be a dick um, and, and treat me with a sense of lack of dignity, I will immediately stand up for myself, immediately berate you, and then ask for your manager. Like that. I, I can do that now because when I had the event at Tim Hortons, yeah, no, um, I was, in, I basically left. So, and the last piece about social disruption is in your control. How much of your post-stroke world will you allow to impact your, your, your social interaction? Like, I wanted to get out, I'll be honest, I wanted to get out and play Airsoft as fast as I could. As fast as I could. One, to get out of the house. You know? Two, to prove to the mates that I'm still viable. Right? To prove to myself I'm still viable. That I still have some of the skills, some of the abilities. I can do some of the things I used to be able to do before the stroke. Um, you know, um... And that's simply because I don't want to be perceived for the rest of my life as that stroke guy, right? 
I, I, that's that's not a place where I want to be. I don't want to be the stroke guy, right? Uh, sadly, you can only control what is honestly in your control, and that's you having the ability to get out into the world as best you can, when and where you can. Recently, um, as of Monday this week, I got my contact lenses with my sunglasses, and I will honestly say that is the best thing that has happened um, for me being able to be activated and reintegrating myself into the world. Right? Um, I've I went to the stroke walking group in the mall here in my city. Um, I did the walk. I spent at least three hours in the mall, ish. Um, was there about 15 minutes early. There for the full two hours and a bit, and then I did a bit of window shopping for Christmas. Uh, I didn't come home a sloppy mess. I didn't come home stumbling. I didn't come home frustrated. I didn't come home fatigued. I didn't come home and need a nap. I didn't have a throbbing, raging headache. Right? The sunglasses. You know what? And there is something that's in your control for your your post stroke social identity, right? Adaptation, right? Adaptation. You may need to adapt. You may need to improvise to overcome the limitations, the difficulties, whatever you want to call it, the, the shit show that's now your stroke. To overcome some of that shit show, you're going to have to improvise and adapt to overcome and then persevere, right? That's the only option you ultimately have, right? The other option is get in your bed, curl up and whimper. And I choose not to do that. So, because again, life is not a survival sport, right? This is not just get up and survive. This is improvise, adapt, overcome, persevere. This is get out and do it. So, you don't have a choice. Because you all, it's literally the Shawshank Redemption model. Get busy living or fucking get busy dying, right? And I choose not to die. Right? I'm not going to curl over my bed and wait for my next stroke. I'm not going to, you know, put on black morning clothes and mourn my former life. No, I'm going to try to get back to where I was as if the stroke never happened. It might take a year and a bit to do it, but I'm more than willing to put in the work. Um, and I'm going to be honest, some days the only easy day was yesterday, right? The only easy day was yesterday. And there's realities, just just out and out realities. So there may, there may be some adaptation you may need to do for your post-stroke sense of social identity and self, right? Some of those might be short-term adaptations, right? I'm anticipating the sunglasses might only be a year or two thing. It could be a forever thing. I, I don't care. But you know what? I can get out in the mall now. And I'm not useless within 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> I can go out into the world and be in the world and have literally limited problems about being in the world. So there are some things that you may not be able to control, but there's nothing you can do about that. There are some things you can control, right? When you go out, where you go out, who you go out with, what you're going to do, how long you're going to stay what you need to do to prepare yourself to get out there, what you need to do to adapt how you interact with your space so you can stay out there to the point where you're not fatigued yet. Um, knowing that you can turn to your friends in any social situation and say either, hey, you know what, I can't go out tonight or today because I'm in a shit state, or you know what, I can only stay until this happens and then I'm going to have to go home. Right? And if they're truly friends and they truly care about you, they truly won't care. Right, that you need to leave, or you have to have a limited exposure, or maybe today, you know what, I can't do it. There have been many cases today, or this this summer, where I wanted to get out and shoot. My body just wouldn't let me do it. And I had to admit, and say, like, nope, can't do it. So, on that note, just keep in mind, you're going to have a change in your identity, socially, post-stroke, right? Um, and I can't predict what your stroke did for you or to you. And I can't predict how the people around you will respond to that. The best I can say is educate them. Tell them what you need in explicit, simple terms. I need this. And if they truly care, they don't, they won't care that you need a bit of help, a bit of understanding, a bit of support. <clears throat> and if they want to get their hackles up, fuck them. They're horrible humans. <clears throat> It's that simple, right? You've either got supporters 
We're horrible humans. There's really no in between here. There's no there's no gray area. There's other people that are going to support you. They're going to be understanding and they're going to help accommodate you and, and, and creatively problem solve with you or there's horrible humans. So the people around you will quickly show which basket they land in. So on that note, I'm just going to say that if you've liked what you've been watching over the last coming up on four months and a couple of weeks or five months and a couple of weeks, please like, share, subscribe. If you know someone that's currently going through their own post-stroke uh, ordeal, right, they're assaulting through their stroke, or someone that's supporting someone going through a stroke, please share the channel with them. They might get something out of it. And if you happen to notice either in yourself or someone around you, the signs or symptoms of a stroke, right, uh, which are generally known as uh, facial droop, uh, you also have... Um, Inability to raise both arms equally effectively or at all. Inability to smile equally effectively or at all. Uh, slurred, stuttering speech, inappropriate word usage for situation or context, right? Please immediately place that person in a position of comfort and dial 911. Something so simple could save a life.